Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Lexi D. Welcome back to Something to Consider. In this episode, I wanted to talk about how the trauma of having been fired from my job a few days ago, a few days, well, a few years, (laughs) gosh, if it had happened a few days ago, I don't think I would be in the space to talk, (laughs) to talk about it, about how being fired from my former job a few years ago, how that still has played a role in my life and and really just how use this as a way to illustrate how trauma and processing trauma is not a linear process. It's something that walks with us throughout life and it comes and it goes. It has ebbs and it has flows. Y'all, I am really, as a side note, I am gearing up to my trip to, for my trip to the Philippines and to Vietnam As I am recording this, it is December, early December, and it is cold. I am born and raised from LA, currently living in LA, and it's cold, y'all. It's just like my birthday is coming up in a week, and I love the warm weather, so I decided that this year I am going to the Philippines and to Vietnam, and I am looking forward to it. I'm so, so excited for it, and that has nothing to do with this episode, but that's kind of where my mind has been at, and I just felt like, I just felt like I would share it. So anyways, anyways, we are talking about trauma, talking about trauma and as it relates to work. So a couple of years ago, I was let go from my former job. And this was as a result of me not meeting performance expectations. Now, I should give you all, and I'm going to give you all some context of both that situation and just also the kind of person I am. So first, the kind of person I am. I am, and I hesitate in saying this because I've kind of been trying to revamp it a little bit, but for much of my life, I've been type A, perfectionist, aim to get straight A's, maybe a bit of a goody two shoes. That has been me. That has been a part of my identity. And so going into any space, I'm the type of person who follows rules. I respect authority, all those kinds of things. In fact, if you've ever taken an, a, I think it's the Myers-Briggs 16 personalities test. I came up as ESTJ. If you know what that is, I'll give you some examples of some professions that they suggest for this type of personality. They suggest being a police officer, being a teacher, just someone who's in charge. And funny enough, that's pretty much what my day to day is like. My my current job is in that space of being in charge. And so with that, with this particular job, when I got the opportunity to work at this company, there were some skill sets that I did not have. Now, this is where it becomes a double-edged sword of stepping into roles for which there is growth that is needed. If you step into roles for which you can do 90% of the job, then there's not really growth. It's a lateral move. And there's a lot of implications to that, but there are equally implications in in stepping into a job for which there are some things you don't know. Now, the, I think the general consensus is that this is good. If you're going to leave a company, leave a role, then you want to step into something that you can grow into. What I have learned is this, while that general sentiment is true and can be good in some ways, If you don't have the support to grow in those areas for which you need support to grow in, it can easily turn into a disaster. And that was the case for me. It was the case for me that I was hired into this role and this company knew I did not have certain skill sets that looking back were maybe more critical for this role than were initially conveyed to me. And so they decided to hire me. And looking back, I, if I were to ever be in this situation again, I definitely know that I would have asked other questions, certain questions around like, 
just what the support would look like, what training would look like, what onboarding would look like to grow me in those areas and just have more of an explicit conversation around these areas for which I simply did not have the skill set. I didn't have a strong enough skill set in those arenas, but are clearly important. And so in this case, with this job, I had been there about a year and some change. It was stressful. Like... <laughs> A large majority of it was super stressful. I was quickly assigned a project with one of their top clients. And I know I keep jumping back and forth, but looking back, part of me too was kind of like, why would they make that decision? Why would they give me one of their top clients knowing that I don't have certain skill sets, knowing that this is one of my first projects? But hey, nonetheless, my actions are my actions. And I, regardless of what they decided, there are still things that I've learned in retrospect that I could have done differently. So in this interaction with this client, from the very beginning, it was clear it was clear the priority of the client, of how important they were, of making sure that this project went well so that in the future, there would hopefully be future engagements and future projects with this particular client. And I understood that. And I think I want to say what happened is it actually swallowed me in overwhelm. I was so overwhelmed with the idea that I was staffed in a critical role in this project and not having some of these skill sets that instead of being vocal about that, I... I let my fear really kind of take hold of things. And so I went into a space of imposter syndrome and I felt like if I were to ask for help at that point, it would make me look unqualified. And at the end of the day, all what happened is when everything unraveled, I was fired anyway. So it's like, I sympathize when individuals struggle with asking for help because as an outsider, it can be easy to dismiss what that feeling is like of if I ask for help, I'm going to look weak. I think whenever someone says that to you, it's easy to be like, no, that's what you should do, right? How many times are we on the opposite end of things where someone is clearly unaware or just incapable of helping us with something? And instead of just coming out right and telling us that, they try to kind of, what what do I want to say? They kind of bob and weave if you've ever <laughs> if you've ever if you've ever done boxing they just basically they avoid being able to stand in that truth of like hey I can't help you in this but I know someone who can or let me get back to you and so that that experience really helped me to see more so from that perspective of when you're when you're dealing with imposter syndrome and you're dealing with this feeling of if I ask for help, I'm going to feel weak. I'm going to feel like that's going to make me look weak. In hindsight, ask for the help. <laughs> in fact, in my current role, because I learned from that situation, every single time there is something <laughs> that I am struggling with, yes, I will try to see if I can resolve it on my own. But if it goes beyond a certain point, I have no problem sharing with my manager, hey, I need help with this. I do not ha- know how to do this. Yes, there are still, there is still maybe a little bit of hesitation on my end of of looking like I don't know what I'm doing, but I would much rather stand in my truth and be let go for that than trying my best to scramble and cover things up and be stressed out in the pre- process and be let go at that point. That's just my, my personal preference at, at this point. So what led to the firing? So I gave you the context about the type of person I am and how I respect authority and how I was aware of the importance of this client. This client was also just to add a little bit more to that. How do I how do I best describe them? They had particular needs and they particular needs and demands and they were able to act that way because they knew the they knew they had the upper hand. They knew that it would be very beneficial for the company that I was with for this project to go the way exactly that they wanted it to go. Now, I'm not here to say that clients can't have certain demeans, certain demeans, <laughs> certain demands <laughs> or needs. I mean, all of us are a client or a customer in some way, but their demands and their needs at times, in my opinion, were unreasonable. And the expectation was that no matter how unreasonable it is, 
I'm supposed to be there to service them. And that was just not something that sit that sat right in my spirit on top of me feeling unqualified in some areas. So put all of that together and it was the perfect storm. So we were at the tail end of the, end of the project and things started to go left. Things were not going as expected. Things were not being... I'm going to leave it as generic as that so I don't go into too many specifics, but things were not going as expected. And we on my on my team side, were trying to resolve the issues as best as we could with what we knew. And I made a decision that ultimately ended my career. And that decision was to basically walk away from the conversation that we were having with the client. It was a conversation that we were having for like maybe five to seven hours. One of my team members was having a meltdown. He was saying things that were very concerning to me about how he essentially wanted to harm himself and trying to disguise that. So we're all, just to give a little bit more context because this might be really confusing for you all listening. We were all on a phone together. My team, we were on one end of the phone and then the customer, the client was on the other end. So they couldn't see what was happening. And I had to be really strong with that mute button because some of the things he was, he was saying was just, it was really concerning. And I I was in this predicament where here I am trying to manage him, but also trying to be responsive to the customer. This is a critical time that we have. I have to be available to them, but obviously there's something more pressing going on with one of my team members. So I made the decision to walk away from the conversation, knowing that we were going to have further conversation in the morning. And that turned out to be the, the ending point to my, to my time with that company. I got written up for making that decision and I had never been written up at a former job. Even when I go back to school days, There's one instance, and maybe that will be another story time that I provide to you all, but outside of that that one instance where there was a disagreement between myself and a teacher, which, side note, what it came down to was she changed, she made, I don't even know if people, if everyone gets citizenship grades, but she gave me an unsatisfactory in citizen in a citizenship grade, but she had to give me my A. So that should tell you that there was some stupid drama going on there. Obviously, I was a stellar student. But in any case, making that decision was the nail in, in the coffin for my time at that company. And so I had got written up, never had been written up before. I remember before being told I was going to be written up, sharing the story with one of my managers or kind of like my manager's manager, that kind of thing. And I was so shattered by, mm, I was so shattered at that point. I was going to say I was so shattered by that moment, but really I, I was shattered before I had been notified about being written up. I was so shattered by the entire experience. I was so stressed out throughout the entire project And I really, I was so stressed out that I didn't have, I didn't have my period for a month. I can't recall a time where that's happened before where I just didn't have my period. And I know it was from the stress. I was waking up on a daily basis just saying, I hope I don't get fired today. I hope I don't get fired. I was constantly preoccupied with that job and specifically with that project. It was very, very, a very, unhealthy, stressful, dark time for me. And so as I was recounting the story of what led to me making that decision of walking away from the conversation with the client, I broke down into tears. I was in a conference room with my director. That's who I was telling this, who I was recalling. That is who I was telling the story to of of what had happened in that moment. And I broke down into tears. I would like to think of myself as someone who keeps her composure, especially in workplace settings. I'm a black woman, so I am well aware that there are certain behaviors that, unfortunately, I have to, I have to be very aware of. I I am, and I am staunchly aware 
that how I come across can be different because I am a black woman. From what I recall, even working at that company at the time, I believe I was the only black woman at the company. It was maybe between 200 and 300 employees, and I believe I was the only black woman. There might have been a black guy, but he was at a different location in the company. Like, we weren't even in the same state, if I'm not mistaken. And so I was keenly aware, and not not to say that I feel like the company was racist or anything like that, because I don't know that it comes down to that, but in any setting, especially where it's not predominantly black, I definitely look at myself and make sure to hold myself to a certain standard. I want to also add that even if it was all black folks, I still hold myself to a certain standard. Sorry, y'all. I'm kind of going off, going off script, going to the left here. But in any case, I hope you're getting my point. I hold myself to a certain standard. And so with that, I'm trying to conduct myself, but I I had had it and I just, I, I broke down into tears and I remember him asking me if I was all right and trying to gather myself together and him saying, okay, well, you're going to get written up for that. And I just, I froze even saying it right now out of my mouth. I, I will never, there are some things that you never forget in life. That moment was one of the moments I'll never forget, especially because like I mentioned before, the type of person I am, I don't get written up. Like I do what I'm supposed to do. And I always had this thought in my mind of when people did get written up and people did get fired, that it had to be because they did something flagrant. Now, someone could argue that what I did in walking away from that conversation was flagrant. I, I go, I could go either way for me knowing the context. I feel like I don't feel like it was flagrant enough to be fired. But nonetheless, that was the decision that was made and I wasn't going to go back and forth with them. So I got written up and I got written up in what was called a PIP, a performance improvement plan. Y'all, if you don't take anything away from this message, just know rule of thumb, if you get a PIP, it's a warning. It's likely, not all the time, but even from what I've seen and doing some research, it could be a warning before you get fired. So I work in an at will, I work in an at will state. And so what that means is that you can get fired with or without cause. And so I guess what they do with pips sometimes is they give you that just as kind of like a a precaution that if you do decide that you're going to sue them, like they can have some type of documentation to build out this story that, hey, no, this person was just not performing. So I get a pip and I sign it and it outlines the situation that happened and I'm going through shock with that. And, you know, I'm telling my parents about this and, and they're telling me I need to look for other jobs. And I'm, I took the pip another way. I took the pip, I took the pip as this is my opportunity to, to prove myself. This is my opportunity to showcase that that was a mistake and I can do better. And so I was very, strong willed and strong minded in this thought up until a coworker of mine had been let go. She was let go from what she shared to me. She hadn't been written up. She was actually the coworker who turned out to be one of my closest coworker friends at the job. And I remember that day vividly as well. She did not share that information with me when they let her go It was something that I heard, heard it through the grapevine. Other team members, another team member, discreetly he had made me aware and I was in so much shock and I I texted her to confirm things and she said, yeah, she had been letting go. She had been letting go. She had been, she had been let go. And later on, I would find out after talking to her that she hadn't been written up. And so there was no warning of this for her. And something in me at that time was like, you're going to be let go soon. More specifically, like you're going to be fired soon for me. That that was the thought going on within me. And I was viciously applying to jobs. I was applying to jobs like day and night and just, I'm like, I got to get out of here because being fired, <laughs> no one wants to be fired. 
when you are walking into hopefully new job new job opportunities one of the first things they ask you is why are you leaving your current role and so to have to explain being fired it becomes a scarlet letter where no matter what you say, no matter the context, it's always rule of thumb going to be a better situation for you to share that you left. Being laid off, I think is more of a gray area, but being terminated and being fired, it's leaving you with a scarlet letter. It is. Now that's not to say all companies will see it that way, but that is how I felt. And so when she was let go, I was feverishly, fever, see, I shouldn't be trying to use new words viciously I was feverishly (laughs) applying for jobs and I got a bite I got a bite at this one company and I had a pre-screening interview it went well we followed up for they followed up for an an in-person interview and y'all y'all you would not believe this so the same Friday I was fired is the same day I had that in-person interview So I was fired that afternoon. I was told to come into HR's office and they said, you know, it's not working out. And I was asking them, well, what about what was written in the PIP? I thought we had a plan. They just repeated again. It's not working out. And I didn't push it any further. I was like, their mind is made up. Just say, okay. And they asked me if I had any more questions. And I said, nope. They gave me my last check and I had a chance to collect my things. I walked out and... I felt a sense of shock. I felt relief. I felt nervous. That was around like 1230. I had my interview at 330. So here I am. I'm I'm going through. I'm going through all this in my head. Should I keep this interview? Should I change it? I had a moment where, of course, I, I broke down and I cried. And long story short, I got the job. <laughs> I got the job. And that has been a testimony to so many things but when i whenever someone asks me to think about how god has moved in my life that is one area that sticks out in my mind because it's something that is so out of this world in terms of the realm of possibility like i don't know anybody else who has this kind of story that it's really affirming for me of how God moves in my life. So in any case, because I see that this is going to start getting long, (laughs) I'm going to jump to what I wanted to share in this episode, which was how this trauma has now affected my life today. So I've had a few instances with my boss where what I've recently learned about myself and in my interactions with him is that his energy is quite triggering for me. And so for some reason, it feels like when I'm speaking to him about certain topics, like I'm on edge and I'm on guard and I'm feeling like I need to defend myself. And it really sucks because when it actually comes down to it, I know that it's not intentional. When I, when we get into my performance reviews, he has nothing but praises to say about me. So it's not, it's not one of those things where these are like smoke signals to other things happening in the background, at least to my knowledge. It's just what's been happening with me. And so ever since being fired from that former job, I am very sensitive to what feels like smoke signals of being fired again. There have been a few moments at this, at the job that I'm at now where I have thought to myself, wow, I might be fired for this. (laughs) And I'll go off applying for jobs. And that's never been the case. Like I've never even come close to it. At least to my knowledge, I have not come close to it. But then I still will go off and apply to these jobs to hopefully give myself some ease of mind or some peace of mind. So most recently, another one of those situations popped up where I felt like I might have done something that might get me fired. (laughs) And when you look at it objectively, because I went through this and I talked through this to a couple of my friends, they're like, what are you talking about? Like, (laughs) But what it reminded me of is in those moments where I'm on high alert, it's a reminder of how of the role that this trauma still plays in my life. While I may not still, it may not be something that's still fresh for me. 
it is still something that affects me in some way. And in some ways it's frustrating, it's irritating, but it also teaches me that trauma is not something that you can package up and forget about. In fact, I did try to do something to that effect before I started this job. So before I started this job, and I had just been fired, I told myself, I mentally told myself, I have to put away my feelings and my reactions to this firing until I have a new job. I do not have the energy to both process this traumatic event and also find a new job. I have to choose one and I chose finding a new job and putting my energy there. And so once I found a new job, then I remember telling myself, it was, I think it was like a Wednesday or a Thursday when the deal had been signed. And I was like, okay, Friday we're going to grieve and we're going to process. And <laughs> I remember, and I mean, the thing is like, I'm laughing about it because it's so ridiculous to think that that's how trauma works. But I, at the same time, I want to give myself credit because I was well-intentioned in that I wanted to cultivate a space and create a, and have specifically a space where I could process what I had just been through. Maybe some people can brush off being fired, but not someone like me and all the context that I gave y'all. I am not, that is not, I'm not that kind of person. And so I remember telling myself Friday is going to be the day to process and just saying, okay, process. It didn't happen. I, I was on such a high from having found another job. I could, I didn't even want to go back into that space of trauma. Frankly, I wanted to forget that it happened. That was until I started having moments at the job, at my current job, where I started to feel inadequate. And so two years later, after that whole situation happened, I look back and I see, I see how much better I've done, how far I've come, how many things I've accomplished. And I've also learned through that experience that I was in an environment that was not fitted for me. I I was not going to do well in that environment. Because to some degree, I'm the same person I was in that environment now, but I'm in a different environment and, I, and I'm thriving. I got a promotion after a year and some change of being there. So the same time that I had been at that former company and got fired, in that same amount of time of being, of being at this company, I got promoted without even trying. I wasn't trying to get promoted. At that point in my mind, I was trying to just not be fired. I was trying to keep my head down and do my job and not go through what I had been through before. So that was something else that had come up for me that when you're put in the wrong environment, this, when you're put in the wrong environment, when you're put in a space that does not support you, it doesn't matter what you do. And sometimes it's not about what you do or even who you are. Sometimes it's about finding the environment that is going to be best for you. And so even with those accomplishments that I look back on and I'm proud of, knowing that even two years coming up on three years, there are still moments in which that trauma comes up for me. It's a reminder to be gentle with myself, be patient with myself. It also helps me to be more sympathetic to others who experience trauma. I will say I'm fortunate in that I've had what I feel like are few traumatic events in my life. I've had some trauma, but few. And so dealing with this has been a teacher in how to process trauma and how to be gentle with others and who are processing their trauma as well. So something to consider is if you are dealing with something that is traumatic, how do you feel like you can cultivate a space or a life that enables you to process this trauma? What are the practices, the routines, the habits that you can take on that can nourish you? 
because I know for me, another part of this that has been important has been self-care and not just the self-care we see of getting nails done and putting on face masks. Those things help, but also having a space every day to check in with myself. Something else that came up for me in that experience and even my recent experience where I felt like I was going to be fired was that I was not giving myself enough self-care. I was not spending an enough mindful, intentional time with myself to see how I was doing. And when I don't do that, then these maladaptive behavior behaviors come out. It's almost rebellion that comes out. <laughs> There's a side of me that's like, oh, there's a side of me that's almost like a guard dog. It's like, I need time to, and space to myself. So if I feel like I'm cornered, I need to do whatever I can to get out of this corner. And I know those situations may still come up, but in as much as I can be proactive about it, to give myself the space proactively versus trying to, versus having to force myself to get it, I feel like that's going to be better for me. So consider those things, consider how trauma plays a role in your life and if you need a therapist, if you need a support group, that has been super essential for me in my journey of processing pain and processing trauma. So don't be ashamed of that. If you need to talk to a pastor or a good friend of yours or journal, there's so many ways to, to process what we're going through. But ultimately, what I would encourage you, do, you to do is to try out different ways and See what speaks to you. See what works for you. So with that, I want to thank you all for listening and I will speak to you all in my next one.